Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Michael Rivero, founder and editor of WhatReallyHappened.com. The European battle lines are now being drawn up with the migration crisis. Hungary doesn't want people passing through their nation, saying they don't want to become a country of Muslims. Is that a real fear? Well, uh, I, I think they're overemphasizing the issue about them being Muslims. But what's going on here, of course, uh, the refugee crisis was started uh, in all these nations where the U.S. is carrying out uh, outright invasion, drone strikes, coup d'etats, overthrows. And it's not just Syrians, it's also the Libyans, uh, it's all these people. But it's also come out that this uh, refugee crisis is being fanned up for two potential reasons. One is that the United States is hoping that the refugees pouring into Europe will cause Europe to back a U.S. plan to break Syria into two components, uh, a safe haven for the Syrian people to go back and live in, which happens to sit over all the oil and will be under a U.S. puppet ruler, and then Assad can stay in control of Damascus and that little chip of land over by the coastline. The other issue is, and this goes back to comments I made about the flood of illegals coming to this country across our southern border from Mexico, from Nicaragua, Costa Rica, is I think part of the New World Order agenda is to deliberately blur our sense of a national or cultural identity to just create sort of this blended pool of humanity that is going to be more agreeable to accepting a single global government and a single global private central bank. And one of the reasons to think that may be part of the agenda is Sky News is now reporting they have found these booklets being put out by a George Soros-funded operation uh, of uh, uh, to the refugees. They've got maps and tips and uh, contact information for welfare agencies they can call uh, to basically get help where they're going. And the organization uh, has sort of adopted this policy that uh, movement is uh, a, a, an international right and the people of the third world have a right to go live in the first world because the first world was built on wealth looted from the third world. And if you remember the movie Dark Knight Rises, uh, the, the villain... Bain makes exactly the same speech, really, to just take it, it's all yours anyway, and uh, it, it's all, we're, we're getting into cartoon uh, uh, type global geopolitical uh, messages here, but it, it, I think the immigration, uh, rather the refugee crisis, has spiraled out of control. I don't think anybody expected it to be as large as it's turned out to be. Mm -hmm. Now, what would the U.S. interest be in causing all these people to move, or is this just an unexpected result of the waging peace? Well, if they were really good at waging war, the wars would be won, and there wouldn't be a need for a larger since World War II. Uh, but a lot of these refugees were being held in refugee camps in the surrounding. Uh, the money gets cut off, and everybody starts getting flooding toward Europe. And again, I think the U.S. was thinking Syria, uh, and uh, it, because they can't get Bashar Assad out which is what they've been trying to do for uh, four years now. And so now they're going to say, well, let's break Syria in two, and Assad can have this little bit over by the coastline, and the rest of it will be the safe haven for the Syrian people, coincidentally happens to sit over all the oil, and we'll, we'll provide a brand new U.S. government for them uh, to live under there. And that may be a reason why the refugee crisis was fanned up uh, worse than it was, but again, it looks like it spiraled out of control, and it's already backflashing, because you have all these countries in Europe are abandoning the open border policy of the European Union, and they're starting to put up uh, fences and uh, razor wire and border checkpoint. Uh, and it may turn out that even more so than the financial crisis, this refugee crisis could shatter the European Union. Australia has had what I would call a, a legal insider coup. They don't have the same prime minister anymore, and it's his own party that took him down. What's the story there? Well, Tony Abbott was being viewed as a little too cooperative with the U.S. foreign policy uh, agenda, and uh, he's he's seen as kind of almost an extremist. Uh, plus, he makes a lot of gaffes in his speeches that the Australians found very offensive, angering, uh, upsetting. And so, yes, he was taken down with a leadership vote within his own party. And uh, uh, we're seeing all these changes all over the globe here where 
the established, entrenched political order is starting to lose their grip. And I think nothing shows that better than the surprise upset victory of Jeremy Corbyn over in Great Britain, where he won the leadership position of the Labour Party by the largest margin in British history, even more so than that of Tony Blair. Uh, he's already started appointing members of his cabinet, including people who are known to be opposed to the independence of the central banks. And, of course, the media is out there screaming he's a nut job, he's going to destroy everything, he's bad for uh, national security, uh, because all of a sudden we're seeing the emergence of politicians who are not going along with the plan for a fascist new world order and endless war. We're seeing the same thing with Donald Trump in this country. The more the media bashes on him, the, the higher his numbers go. And there doesn't seem to be any way of stopping him uh, short of uh, a tragic airplane accident or a crazed lone nut assassin. Well, in Canada, the left-wing side, the NDP, is leading in the polls with us going in, into an election. We've had the bank say, don't elect an NDP government. There'll be a disaster for the economy. Are they crying wolf? Uh, well, of course they're crying wolf uh, because they've worked very hard to establish private central bankers' control over all these nations and all of the people of these nations are standing and realizing private central banks don't exist to serve the nation and its people. They exist to serve themselves and grow rich by looting ordinary people. Uh, I think that Comer lawsuit that you have up there really opened a lot of Canadian people's eyes to learn that their government, which is allowed to get interest-free loans from the Bank of Canada, instead was getting loans at interest from private bankers and forcing the Canadian people to pay those interest payments. And I, I think there's, we're seeing the beginning of a global backlash against this uh, private central banking scam and their lackeys in government. And I, I think here in the United States, when we have our elections next year, there's going to be a tremendous anti-incumbent fever sweeping across the entire city of Washington, D.C. Well, if the American people like Trump, Jimmy Fallon has never had higher ratings than when he had Donald Trump on on Friday night. Yeah, I mean, Trump's, he's, he's a star. He's got star power, he's, and the, again, the more the media attack him, uh, the more people are flocking to his support. And by the way, there was an interesting observation made because the British media was treating Jeremy Corbyn the same way the American people are treating, uh, the American media are treating Donald Trump. So anybody who thinks Trump is unelectable better take a good look at what just happened in Great Britain. But somebody pointed out that what really changed the game for Jeremy Corbyn is every time the corporate media came out and misquoted him in order to demonize him or criticize him, social media would light up saying, no, that's not what Corbyn actually said. And so the ability of the corporate media to lie to us all to serve a political agenda has been greatly diminished, if not outright erased. And we're seeing the same thing here in the U.S. Well, I think the first person who perhaps created a gateway here is Jesse Ventura. Nobody thought a former wrestler would be able to become the governor of Minnesota, and he's been a kingpin supporting conspiracy theories and investigating them for a long period of time. It'd be hard to convince him that just because you're popular, you can't get elected. Well, I, I think so, uh, but I, I think what we're really seeing here, it's, it's less about popularity. It's more about the world being fed up with the pre-made, pre-approved establishment political candidates every election. And now all of a sudden people are realizing there are alternatives out there. Uh, the entrenched political powers in the United States have stayed where they are with this illusion that there are no alternatives. You're going to have to pick one of us anyway, so just pick one of us and accept the higher taxes and more dictatorship gracefully. And now all of a sudden we're seeing all of these... Uh, I'm not sure anti-establishment is the correct word, but definitely non-establishment candidates making tremendous gains. Uh, and we're seeing certainly Hillary Clinton's numbers have fallen 21 points just since July. She can't get away from the email scandal. There's been a new revelation today that the email copy she gave to Ju uh, Judicial Watch and the State Department have huge gaps in the timeline, one of them as long as a month. Nobody's going to believe that Hillary Clinton did not conduct State Department business for an entire month. And it's just getting worse and worse. There's a campaign to oust the chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, and the old guard is definitely thrashing around and failing. Uh, we're still seeing the Israel lobby in the United States trying to find some way to derail the P5 plus 1 deal. And it's important to note, over in Great Britain, the Israel lobby there were absolutely dead set that they were not going to let Jeremy Corbyn get elected 
So they've been handed a huge defeat there, and that's a good thing because all of a sudden everybody around the world who's in a country where the Israel lobby is controlling things, they're starting to realize the, the grip isn't, you know, perfect. Uh, the, the grip is slipping. Israel's ability to subvert these governments with impunity is starting to erode away, mostly because the people in these countries understand now that's what's been going on. Why is the U.S. still so obsessed with the Middle East when right now we have enough oil here in the West, in Canada and the U.S., to sustain our economies? Well, it's not about using the oil. It's about what currency the oil is being sold for. Because when Richard Nixon ended gold convertibility of the U.S., Federal Reserve note, dollar, uh, the rest of the world started to say, well, I, we really don't need dollars anymore. Uh, and so the U.S. made a deal with all the oil nations of the Middle East. If you will sell your oil only for the U.S. dollar and invest that money back in the U.S., we will militarily protect you and guarantee your security. And it was called the petrodollar deal. And it worked very well until shortly after 9-11, when it became very obvious that all of a sudden the United States could not exert any influence over Israel, and Israel started attacking people around them. And so oil nations are starting to sell their oil for other currencies, even at the risk of being invaded. Uh, in 2002, Iraq got permission from the United Nations to sell their oil for euros. One year later, the U.S. invades, screaming nuclear weapons of mass destruction. They lynch Saddam Hussein, and Iraq's oil is back on the world market only for the U.S. dollar. Same thing in Libya. Gaddafi was doing really well, invented a, uh, a basically kicked out the private central bank of Libya, established a state bank and a new value-based currency, the gold dinar, then told the world, if you want to buy Libya's oil, you will have to buy it from, with the gold dinar. U.S. goes in, kills Gaddafi, sets up a private central bank, gold for the gold dinar vanishes. Because as long as all of the uh, natural resources on the planet are being traded globally for the U.S. dollar, then everybody on Earth has to come to the United States and either borrow those dollars at interest or bring us manufactured goods and agricultural produce to get those ink and paper notes before they can conduct raw material purchases or even just do trade across the borders. But lately, that dollar hegemony is in, uh, in danger. The world is starting to turn to the ruble and the yuan. And because the U.S. got lazy and got dependent on everybody using the dollar for global trade and banking, we've allowed our manufacturing to decline. Uh, we've destroyed our agricultural exports with the GMO uh, experiment. And now the U.S. economy is dependent on the interest and other revenues generated from the dollar being used for global trade and banking. And they're willing to uh, hang on to that. Uh, through force of arms. And that is really the motive behind all these wars in all these countries. Uh, we're seeing these countries trying to kick out their U.S. puppet rulers, uh, and the U.S. has to go in and reinvade them. We're going into Iraq for the third time. We're going into Libya for the second time, going into Yemen for the second time, because these gosh darn conquered U.S. provinces won't stay conquered. And it, it, there are so many parallels between what's going on with the United States and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And at this point, it does look like at some point in the not very distant future, the U.S. is going to follow the old Soviet Union into the dustbin of history. So it really turns out that currency wars are shooting wars. They just don't call them that. Well, currency wars can lead to shooting wars. And that's what we're seeing right now. Yes. We'll have more with Michael Rovero right after the break. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel in Oliver, October 2nd, in Kelowna, October 3rd. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. In Goddard We Trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Michael Rivero. Michael, yet another college shooting are these things ever going to end, and can we trace them back to the use of psychotic drugs? We can in most cases. However, the shooting today uh, is starting to look like it was a personal grievance between the shooter, who they're now saying was an employee of the college, and this one history professor. Only one person got shot, uh, and there, there appears to have been some kind of a disagreement between them that, that simply blew up. So 
the media is already dropping it because it's not a mass shooting. It's not crazed, wacko person. Uh, and and, and the, the bottom line is that there have been so many of these shootings that have turned out to be hoaxes. Uh, I, I think they just sort of walked away from this one. Uh, but there is no doubt that there is an agenda in the U.S. government to try and find some way to disarm the American people because the U.S. government understands uh, they pushed us right to the edge of a revolution. There was actually a poll done recently that found 29% of Americans would support a military overthrow of the government of Washington, D.C. And I'm not in that 29%. I don't think a military uh, overthrow would make life better for us here in the United States of America. But the fact that they got 29% of the respondents to say, yeah, I'd go along with that, tells you just how angry and frustrated and fed up with the federal government the American people have become. Wow, that's an amazing number, a third of Americans almost. Yes. In Egypt, a convoy carrying Mexican tourists was attacked by the Egyptian military, and from the photos I saw, this wasn't a couple of bullet holes. They nuked the guys and then said, well, they didn't have permission to be there. The Egyptian tourist guide union says, oh, yes, we did have permission to do there. Well, what is Egypt trying to do? Don't they depend on tourism for their national income? Well, the, the tourism is very important, but what we're seeing is there's been a ramp up of militarism uh, in the Sinai. Uh, the U.S. is sending more troops in there ostensibly because ISIS is on the ground in uh, Sinai, and all of these frontline troops, they're constantly being told ISIS is coming, the enemy is coming, and they're all on, on hair trigger alerts and probably on their fair share of medication as well. Somebody made a mistake and misidentified them, and uh, they killed them, and they don't want to say it was just a case of mistaken identity, so they're trying to justify it, saying they shouldn't have been there, and it gets into this he said, she said with the Egyptian Tourism Authority. It's a tragedy any way that you, you, you put it, but during these major wars, uh, friendly fire killings are a fact of life. And it's it's not confined just to this war either. How popular have cars become in the U.S. again? So many people have said, uh, North Americans don't want to drive anymore. We want robots to do it. But do we really? No, the numbers do not support that. Uh, the Agenda 21 people and certainly the companies that manufacture mass transportation are out there saying, Americans don't want to drive. They don't want to be bothered. They, you know, they want to play with their tablets and iPhones while they're conveyed to where they're going to go. Uh, but car sales are up in the United States. Of course, they're making very attractive deals right now uh, to, to move those cars. But most Americans want the ability to decide when and where they're going to go and what time they're going to get there. Uh, a lot of occupations here in the United States of America require that kind of flexibility. There are a lot of jobs that are out there where you cannot rely on trains and buses to get you where you need to go when you need to get there. And, and that's just a, a reality. And there's also a de-urbanization going on where people are finding the inner cities are both too expensive and too dangerous to live in, and they're choosing to basically start flowing back out to the suburban and even the rural areas where there is no mass transportation, and you've got to have cars. Uh, but certainly uh, there's a big push to try and get everybody corralled into the cities where they're easier to control and easier to tax, uh, and taking away... Uh, individual cars is a good way to do that. On your website, the science behind cannabinoids is clear. Marijuana helps the brain achieve breakthroughs in learning, consciousness, and understanding. Of course, we have a federal government in Canada that says the exact opposite. Well, your government doesn't want people to be thinking better and clearer and having intellectual breakthroughs because then you start questioning what the government is saying. But it's been known for a very, very long time that marijuana use actually stimulates the growth of brain cells unlike alcohol, which will kill them. And I, there was a very interesting uh, uh, incident that happened some years ago where Cheech Marin of Cheech and Chong uh, was on uh, Jeopardy with uh, Anderson Cooper, who's supposed to be this big intellectual corporate media uh, figure. And Cheech just absolutely uh, overwhelmed him and, uh, and won the game for charity. Uh, and... and yeah, I mean, we all know Cheech Marin smoked a lot of marijuana. So that's been known for a very, very long time. But the uh, uh, problem with marijuana is you can grow it in your backyard, and that means it can't be sold and commoditized as a product and it can't be taxed. And the opposition to legalization of marijuana is coming primarily from the uh, tobacco and alcohol industries, uh, which can be commoditized and uh, taxed. And both products, if used in, as intended, can kill you. Uh, absolutely. 
Uh, by the way, uh, they've noticed over in Colorado since the legalization of marijuana there that fatal car accidents on the highway have gone way, way down. And, of course, that was one of the big pieces of propaganda that, oh, if you let everybody smoke marijuana, their, their traffic's going to be terrible and people are going to be dying. No, actually, it, it's, the opposite has happened. The sheriff of King County, Washington, said since they legalized marijuana, the number of impaired drivers being found is also down. Yeah, very much so, because people just stay at home and they're relaxing and they're off the roads, and that's a good thing. Michael, anything else you wanted to throw in today? Well, uh, yeah, I'd like to tell all of your listeners that I'm going to be on the Coast to Coast radio program tonight from 10 p.m. to midnight Pacific time, and I hope you'll make a point of tuning in and taking a listen, uh, because it's going to be two hours talking about uh, Hillary's emails, uh, the Syrian refugee, Libyan refugee crisis, and various other topics as well. So I hope you'll all tune in. Thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thank you for having me. My guest has been Michael Rivero, founder and editor of WhatReallyHappened.com. You're listening to The Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Check out our popular YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.